Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Uh, who am I and, and what qualifies me to speak about something as, as, uh, as uh, sort of, you know, global and selective as every one of you has dealt with it. Every one of you has come across it. You're probably doing it on a daily basis. Um, so who am I to talk about it? I'm, uh, I've had the privilege, great privilege of working with Open Media. Open Media is Canadian, nonprofit. and uh, we work on digital issues. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about them in a second. But what I have been given the honor of doing is being their data intelligence coordinator, as pompous of a title as it is. It really comes down to just trying to understand what is it that our campaigns do. Everything we do is run online. Everything generates data. My job has been, my privilege has been to, to look at the data, try to sort of look at the patterns, try to understand whether we can read uh, some sort of a larger uh, trends out of that uh, sort of data. And uh, as, as you all mentioned, I had, a, I had another privilege, great privilege, to, to present at the Digital Nonprofit Conference. And that was a sort of a result of our sort of year long journey. This is a continuation. We, uh, over the last year, been trying to think about how to conceptualize online engagement. And uh, so this is, that's, that's why I'm here. And, and I'm not here to sort of make any definitive conclusions. You know, and I know that the title of the talk is you know, Selectivism, which would one really want to believe that I'm here to. Uh, and Selectivism, well, no, I'm just here to really share, share what we've learned as an organization and to perhaps help in whatever journey your, uh, you or your organization is on. Well, first of all, let me just ask a question. Uh, how many of you have a Slack to this bit today? How many of you have done something that would probably count as Selectivism? Whatever your understanding of Selectivism. Great. How many of you have today in your work encouraged selectivism? <laughs> How many of you have posted something on Facebook which technically counts as encouraging selectivism? How many of you have posted a Twitter or to Twitter or you know send an email to someone to sign a petition? Right. That's the point. We may and last the last question is how many of you think that selectivism is a good thing? <laughs> well, there you go. So it's, it's an interesting uh, conundrum. So a lot of, all of us do it, a lot of us do it, but uh, not all of us like it. The sort of general understanding, and I'm sorry you can't really read this, but the, the usual understanding of Slacktivism is that it stands the opposite spectrum uh, of sort of engagement from activism. And there's the distinction that there is such a thing as true activism, and there is Slacktivism. What's funny about this image, and I'm sorry you can't read it, but on the very far side, it's the prayer and thoughts. That counts as activism as well. <laughs> right next to them are all of the online actions that we can do. Signing a petition, sending, liking something, sharing something. And true activism only begins once you move into sort of away from keyboard and into real life. That's sort of the, the traditional understanding of activism. There are many scholars, such as Evgeny Morozov, who are just vivid, vivid when it comes to selectivism. They've been very critical of, of the sort of the emerging pattern of uh, youth engagement, which really is about, you know, flipping things from the comfort of their couch. Things such as inferior mode of activism, uh, the fact that armchair contributors are seen as, as unable to make a difference, and that in the larger sense of things, Collectivists uh, damage every genuine political movement they touch, creates a sort of a very derogatory understanding of selectivism. And, and uh, one that organizations such as mine is a bit struggling with. Uh, the most sort of common definition, let's establish some groundwork, uh, is that selectivism is whatever is sort of low cost and low risk to the supporter. When you like something or share something online, you're not going to get arrested. Likely, in this country, we are very privileged to, to be able to not wear a sit -up when you like something. There are countries when, that's not the, when that is not the case. Uh, but, you know, in this context, if you go out to a protest or sabotage something, that's a whole another story, right? So it's a low-cost, low-risk activity that's taking place on social media for various, for various reasons. Now, with these definitions, we have that sort of dichotomy, again, between activism and activism. Uh, Morozov has argued that we, everyone who's encouraging our slacktivism is helping to raise a generation of slacktivists, people who will not be able to politically engage. We are actually furthering the gap from traditional forms of political engagement. That's sort of the critique that uh, has been around. And all of that focuses always usually on the isolated acts of slacktivism. 
on that one link, on that one like or share that someone has exhibited. Now, if this is the definition, then I'll admit that we are guilty as charged. Open media is entirely built on Slack visit. Pretty much, not all of our work, but a lot of our work is about selectivism. We are trying to devise ways to make people go on things, to make people sign things, to make people like things, share things, and so forth. Even our front page features a button that's pretty big. It promises you that you can take action and you can stop the security of TPP. Now, I don't know if you think you know what TPP is, the Transpacific like Partnership. It's a major trivial. One click is left and not going to stop it. Yes, we encourage that behavior and are therefore guilty as charged. This, yeah, so our, for those of you who may not be familiar with open media, we are a yeah, Canadian, uh, Vancouver based nonprofit. We have one of the largest communities um, in, in Canada, which is very exciting. Uh, our focus is on, on sort of, our primary focus is on low barrier, online based actions. From the user perspective, they're all very low cost and low risk. We don't we really don't protest, we don't sabotage things, we don't, um, some, well, we'll get to that in a bit. But um, <laughs> overall, most of our online base, base actions are very much in the definition of selectivism. Our three core issues that we work on is privacy, free expression, and access. But I'm not really here to talk about the campaign aspect, or the, yeah, the campaigns that we run on, but more about the sort of broader theory of engagement. Our sort of and that this is very much just like this model, and I hope this is very hard to read, but it, it's a very simple idea of us creating a petition, then enough people signing it to generate media attention, and enough signatures that generate enough media attention can then generate enough political change to enact whatever it is that we wanted to enact in the beginning. That's our model. That's how we brand campaigns. This was created by Lenza Pinto, our, our former communications manager, back in 2010, when we defeated uh, the usage-based billing uh, idea of CRTC, which wanted to charge users for internet uh, by how much they download it. Pretty ridiculous idea. Uh, and we just yeah, put on a petition, people signed it. This, if this, is, this is just a prime example of collectivism. The fact that it worked is, uh, is something that we need to not ignore and not dismiss. We have had major impact on Canadian digital policy, despite focusing entirely on most of our campaigns, effective campaigns, have been focused on Islamism. Stop the media, stop online spying, we defeated bills, we'll talk about in a second as well. Um, we are increasing our focus on the national system. PPP is a, is a global issue, and it's a much more complex issue, and yet through collectivism, we've been able to engage people around this and build a large, massive community around the world that, uh, that is now uh, against, against the deal. Why we do all that is because we believe that collectivism is a valid type of engagement. I'll, I'll, I'll iterate the point. It's, here, it's important to acknowledge that there is not one type of engagement, or there is not. We'll talk about the different types of engagement in a bit. But right off the bat, we do not dare to dismiss collectivism as irrelevant and as, as dangerous or, or uh, you know, bad for society. Now, there's, on a very theoretical level, we could talk about how collectivism leads to degradation of individuals' ability to vote, political participate, to vote. Uh, you know, studies have yet to be done into um, whether selectivists are less likely to vote or more likely to vote. Those would be very interesting ideas. But until we have those answers, we're not going to refuse or, you know, reject collectivism as, a, as an invalid form of engagement. A parallel that one blogger has used to defend collectivism is that collectivism is kind of like the first kiss. It expresses interest. Uh, you may not get a second date out of it, and it certainly doesn't make a baby, but it's, it counts. It still counts. And that's the idea here. Because when it comes to digital engagement, everything that you do online, if it's regarded in an isolated instance, that's that one click, one like, one share, you can always dismiss that as, as collectivism. But if we are to believe that there is such a thing as online activism, and the fact that you're here uh, leads me to believe that perhaps you do, and your organizations and groups perhaps use the internet to, to save the world, or to change the world, then uh, we need to not reject the idea of collectivism. Quite on the contrary, Ethan argues that 
this kind of type of fast activism, one that's not as deep as the traditional forms of protesting, sabotaging, that's actually the only way to engage on young generation. It is compatible with our with our fast-paced society. And that's that's a that's a valid point. In a similar line of thinking, and this is just sort of a logical exercise, an engaged supporter, who's an engaged supporter online? A collectivist. Given your most engaged supporter, someone who is donating to you, started as a collectivist. They saw it somewhere, they saw it week, they liked it, um, and eventually they donated. And it is that eventuality of donating, that journey that they took from that first click to donating, to volunteer, to doing some sort of a deep writing related to the matter, whatever it is, it is that journey that matters. It's not the first click. You cannot, there's no point in talking about that. It's that journey that matters, and that's what uh, I'll, I'll be talking about most. Uh, before we go there, it's important to establish some sort of theoretical understanding of collectivism. Because, uh, and I've been using the word collectivism now, even though the title is collectivism, and you could be using the word interactivism, or whatever you want to call it, or armchair activism, it doesn't matter. The word collectivism has sort of that derogatory undertone, so I switched to collectivism, which is more, which is more subtle and more, uh, just a nicer word. So let's, uh, Let's try to redefine collectivism, or sort of establish some sort of groundwork from where we can start. What does what constitutes collectivism? What doesn't? This is based on the work of, of Max Halupka, who is from uh, Australia, in terms of Canberra, and he just published an article uh, which is quite remarkable because it doesn't necessarily defend collectivism, but it offers a redefinition and it sort of draws a much broader sort of conceptual understanding of what collectivism is and isn't. Uh, his idea of collectivism revolves around sort of seven key points. Some of them are pretty obvious, some of them are a little bit more complex. And, and I, I apologize if this is a little bit too thick. If you have any question at any time, if I don't pronounce things well, I'm sorry, I'm check, I'm uh, ESL. Um, but feel free to ask a question or clarification, I'm happy to uh, answer. So collectivism, of course, has to be uh, taken place in mind. That's pretty obvious. One of the key things in his argument is that collectivism engages an existing political object. Now, what is a political object? It's a tweet. It's a video that you've created. It's a petition that you've built. It's a website. It's a you know, Facebook post, sharing it, meme. You've created something. You've put it out there. And someone has engaged with it. And that act of engagement is a collectivism. But that object that they are engaging with has already been created by someone else, most likely you. That's precisely why it is an impulsive gesture. It's not a premediated step, premeditated step. You're not thinking about becoming collectivist today. You're not going to look for that image that you're going to like or share. You see something and you impulsively and reflexively like it or share it or comment on it and engage in the act of collectivism. And as such, it's non committal. It's as the first kiss. You may not get a second date out of it. <laughs> it's, it's not like you're you know, entering someone's, you're, you may have joined someone's database by signing a petition. But it doesn't mean that that person who's done that is building your cross or stressing, you know, whatever your agenda is. That's never the case. If that's their first step of engagement, then they've really just done the first step towards organization. Yes, Jay? So if you're getting blowback back from putting something online, and all of a sudden you're getting a hundred responses to people who don't like what you said, would that still work inside your wall? Oh yeah, that's technically collectivism as well. It's public, it's a reaction. Political, it's a type of political engagement. It doesn't necessarily be positive, it can be negative. But it's still it's an engagement that engages something that's been already created. And it's an impulsive reaction. So collectivism can also be negative. Somebody, you know, someone comments or trashes your blog post or, or you know or Facebook post, it happens all the time. Then that's to me, in my view at least, it counts as collectivism. And, and you know, many of you may disagree with that. Uh, but yeah, that's based on this definition it would Falling. Collectivism inherently does not draw on any specialized knowledge. You don't need to know the ins and outs of the DPT and its 27 chapters to understand, uh, to like an image that portrays, you know, one simple element about the 3D that you just found amusing and you just like it or share it. It really is in that impulsiveness lies sort of very surface touch on the issue. If you don't dive into the issue, you just really touch the surface of something. And as such, it's also easily replicated, which is why activism can be done by masses and, and 
do change, um, as we will see in a bit. So just to reiterate the point that I will follow up on a, a little in a little bit, collectivism, we extend the definition that we talked about a little bit ago, should be understood as an impulsive response, that's one important thing, to an engagement with an established political object. Again, the object is a petition tweet and so forth. In other words, things that get created and put out there, expected and facilitated selectively. Like Put it out there for a reason. And that's, uh, so let's keep that definition of collectivism in mind. As I said in the, in the earlier, uh, a lot of the critique that's, that's written around is based on the fact that uh, we're centered on the sort of isolated acts of, of collectivism. The fact that one life is really not going to save the world. Of course it isn't. It's not going to do anything. But if you have a million people clicking the same thing, even if it's the most low barrier thing, all of them were sitting on a garbage somewhere, and all of them, you know, did nothing, you can still affect change. As you can see, uh, I think that's the next slide. Yes. Back in 2011, uh, the Canadian government is going to introduce a, the Omnibus Crime Bill, and in it was to be a uh, clause that it was going to introduce some, something called lawful access. In other words, if, if the RCMP the power to Spy on me essentially, ask the ISPs for your information. Uh, complex issue, but essentially that was the gist of it. We didn't like it, not one bit, uh, so we started a petition. It was the most simple a petition, the simple action page, and 7,000 people uh, uh, signed it. And it was the lowest of barriers that people had to cross to sign the petition. And yet that was enough to defeat the bill. When, when the bill was, uh, when the, yeah, the list was tabled, there was no sign of, of lawful access. It's enough, and then Big Dave, who was the guy who was trying to push it through, uh, that called up because of us, anyway, it was a great, great thing. And, and the reaction was, of course, that slacktivism is defeated something. That slacktivism is one. When it comes to, comes to it, technically, we could end the conversation here. Because if slacktivism works, why even talk about it? Because it does work. It worked for us twice. We stopped, stopped the meter. And a spying bill. So if it works, if you get enough people to do something super simple, but that in itself is enough to affect political change, then what's wrong with slacktivism? The reason why we need to talk about slacktivism is not so much in that sort of collective power of slacktivism, but in regard to an individual. And I'll try to uh, iterate that point a little bit more clearly. If one individual clicks one thing, that's, that's nothing. But if one individual clicks a thousand links that you put out there, and that's a serious engagement. And if you've planned those links or those clicks purposefully and with a strategy and with a tactic, then you're not no longer dealing with collectivism. You're dealing with a deep and repetitive engagement. A red, you know, it's, a, it's something that, it's, it's a repeated act of engagement. If, if you get to, you know, it's not about, sorry if I, this is a bit <laughs> tricky to explain in terms of. If you have a million people click a link, sure, it can make a change. But for an individual, it does nothing. An individual will perhaps, just as much as a view, become lethargic, will not vote. But if you get an individual to take, you know, a thousand political actions online, I don't have an evidence, empirical evidence for this, but I would bet you that that individual is more likely to not vote. Uh, with someone who hasn't. And we'll get to the instant, and you know, feel free to disagree again, but uh, I'll get to some numbers later on and, and some conclusions that we, we've drawn. And so, if we accept that collectivism is a valid type of engagement, and that with collectivism you can actually achieve or affect political change, yes? I was just going to say that Robert Calvini's book, Persuasion, has some great examples of exactly what you're talking about. No, it's, it's a great book. It's a, yeah, that's a yeah, great resource. Thank you for, for bringing it up. Um, yeah, actually, this idea of engagement 
really applies to many, many things. You know, it's used in marketing strategy. Uh, we just are putting the spin on it that applies to nonprofits. Uh, but thank you for, for that. So how can you leverage activism to achieve many meaningful change? How can you develop a strategy that actually leads to an effective change with clicks, when all you have is clicks? Now, open media is an entirely digital-based organization. We work on digital issues. We don't we have supporters around the world. We can't, you know, say, let's meet up on you know to the party art gallery tomorrow night and let's do something. It's everything that we do has to be online based. So we have to think about how to how to engage people online. And the way we answered this question was by inviting our supporters on a journey up the mountain of engagement. Now, how many of you were at the Digital Nonprofit Conference or at Cambridge uh, this summer? Um, cool. Not that many. Yeah. That's good. Uh, because I explained this there, so I just want to make sure that I'm not repeating myself to many of you. Uh, so, mountain of engagement. I'll try to explain the idea of mountain of engagement. And, and I, I like to use imagery, uh, metaphors for things, so I hope this one makes sense. Again, feel free to ask for any clarifications. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the pyramid of engagement developed by Brown Wire um, back in a couple of years ago? The gist of the pyramid of engagement is that you divide, you take all of the types of engagement that you expect from your supporters, be it a share, uh, reading an email, clicking an email, signing a petition, writing a letter to the editor, donating. You put all of that out on the table, and then you divide it onto levels based on how much of an engagement it is from the user. Or supporter. So level one is level observing. So that's someone who reads your email, follows you on Facebook, uh, you know, can like things, sure, but uh, yeah, it's the idea of observing. It's a level of engagement, sure, but it's the low, lowest possible. You got their attention, but you, they haven't done anything. Level two is following. So again, this is this is their model, and you can adapt it to whatever how many how many you know, levels you want. Uh, and I'll show up how, how we've done it for, for one of our campaigns. Um, but as you sort of go up through endorsing, which is, you know, petition signature, contributing, it means that they have sent in an idea, they fill out a form or something, they've contributed their idea to, to the campaign, uh, or, or financial contributed, uh, all the way up to owning and leading, when they, you know, take initiative in their communities, when they do something, when they create a video or something, uh, you can simply, you can, it's a very logical thing, you can divide all the types of engagement onto that pyramid. And you can say, this action falls in there. And then, when a supporter does an action, you can say that supporter is on level 4. Because they have engaged in a, in a you know, very high barrier action, therefore we can categorize them as such, as such. And you can expect a certain level of engagement from them, because they have exerted it already. And so this is this sort of represents the vertical journey. And if you return back to the idea of the mountain, if you go up the mountain, you're engaging more and more. You're exhibiting, you know, deeper engagement. You're engaging deeper. I just repeated myself there. Uh, but that's the end of the vertical journey. Now to illustrate how we've uh, approached this idea was uh, in one of our campaigns. This was around the issue of PPP uh, back in the fall, and we've. Uh, yeah, taken that model developed by Brown Wire, and we sort of adapted it to one of our campaigns. So we took, you know, we developed and said, you know, we want to do PPP. Well, we have the capacity to develop this many tools. And then we developed them and divided them onto the different levels as we as we uh, as we saw fit. So on level one, of course, website traffic, uh, people who open emails, saw Facebook posts, something that we saw, we could you know throw in that category. Anyone who has signed those four and five of those petitions was automatically on level two. So we are able to track how many people are on level two. Or people sharing things on Facebook. Then contributing, people who donated, um, leading, people who join our internet down who called in, or, you know. The idea was really to categorize the types of engagement that we were creating for around this particular campaign. And at the beginning of the campaign, everyone was down at observing, or even below observing. They weren't even reading our emails. The point of the whole campaign was to get as many people up, because the more people you get up, the wider sort of the, the birth from which, or you know, the wider community of people you get back. Because once people are leading or owning, they are speaking to their friends on in social circles, and you have a loop that follows. So the, the whole idea was to move people up. Now, how do we get from a mountain or from a pyramid to a mountain? That's the that's a tricky piece. Uh, so I'll just try to briefly explain. 
as I said, we work on three issues. Uh, free expression is one of them. We also work on access and privacy. So suddenly we had three variants. We divided all of our, in the, our entire list, first into three categories based on what issues people are engaged with, and then secondly, into the different levels of engagement. So type two supporter, a level two supporter, I can use that term, was someone who has done a petition. It doesn't really matter where and which, you know, on what issue they engage, but it was the same type of engagement. Therefore, they would be categorized as level two. And the different levels would be corresponding across the parameters. Once we did this, we realized that as people are sent those parameters, they naturally, you know, meet in the center. Most engaged people have done actions across all different campaigns and are meeting in the center. They have donated on multiple campaigns, and therefore there is this sort of movement towards the center or the top of the mountain. See where I'm getting at here? We are starting to see a mountain. So when if you were to cut this out, make it into a cone. Actually, the digital nonprofit may actually had a cone, like a print it out, and like that. Yeah, but I lost it. Um, you end up with the mountain. And this is, of course, just a picture of a mountain with contours on. And it's the same, exactly the same idea. You look at a mountain, and then you look at the sort of lines that surmount it. And you could look at any of those and say, oh, that's level two. And we could look, divide it into three sides and then say, okay, this is the privacy side. This is the access side, it's the free expression, but the contour is always the same height. That's how contour align works. Uh, yeah. So that's that was the idea. Does that at all make sense? Or that, that was the sort of basic principle of how we how we come up with the model of a mountain. Once we did that, we realized that aside from the sort of vertical journey that we can uh, encourage and instill, you know, we can try to climb people up to upper levels, you can Someone takes a two, level two action. Sorry, I'm, I'm near the okay. the whole time. Um, <laughs> we can send them an email to you know participate in the next step to donate, right? because that's the next step after taking a simple action, or that's how we defined it at the time. But it turned out that some people are not ready to do that yet. When someone does that first click, signs a petition. Doesn't mean that they are aligned with your cause. They just found your image file or something, or your petition was, you know, their friend signed it or something. They are not ready to donate. Why would they? And we realize that once you think about the engagement mountain, you realize that just as you can go up, you can also go around. And people can engage on level two actions across different issues. And how much of an impact that has, I'll, I'll show in a bit, but we realize that people can take, you know, uh, Action number one, and then action number two, or from that sort of sector. So, in other words, they put it on a privacy action, and then an access action, instead of doing a donating, taking the next step in privacy. So, anyway, we have a now two dimensional movement here up and around. And in this model of a mountain, every click that a supporter does becomes like a step on the mountain. What and, and recall now the definition that we are, are working with here, that collectivism engages an existing political object. When you apply that model to the other mountain, when you put out a tweet, it's kind of like a signpost navigation that you're putting out there, that someone can click on to get closer to whatever the cause, that, whatever the cause is that you're, you're perpetrating, or exerting, or getting out there. Um, Every single click becomes still a mountain. And more clicks you gather, the deeper engagement you get. And that's not just a generalized statement, that is an actual observation that we've, we've seen. And as I said, your core supporters, people who actually are serious about your issue, will meet in the center. Will meet in what you could call the core, and we'll talk about the core in a second as well. I'm saying we'll talk about a lot of things in a second, and I'll probably not get to them. If I don't, just remind me, please. Uh, the key element here to acknowledge or to realize is that every single one has may have, may have taken a different journey up. Whereas someone was ready to donate right away after taking the petition on the thank you page, there's a donate form, or that's how we have it now. Uh, they may donate right away because they're very passionate about something, but there may be, you know, majority of people don't do that. They're not ready to donate. Maybe after taking two, three, four actions, maybe you're invested enough to donate. Maybe after exploring the organization by taking other actions that we put out there, other issues, then maybe you donate. Whatever journey you've taken, whatever, how many clicks it took for you, 
uh, you eventually all meet in the center. That's the, that's the beauty of the model. <laughs> Two, and this is, we're getting a little bit to the technical side of things. Uh, as you can see, a lot of this is just sort of theoretical or modeling sort of this idea. We'll get to some of the uh, technical details of this uh, later. I'm, I'm actually not sure what the time is at all. Anyone else? We've got 20 to 7. 20 to 7, okay. You've got a good half hour. Good half hour, well, that's grand. You may not need it. Uh, Anyway, so this whole model can only work if you can ascertain where on that sort of mountain of engagement people are. Now that you've defined, defined level two, level three, level four, level five, and you can defi define that level on each issue that you're working on, and maybe you're working on seven, you know, ten, ten hundred issues, you may, may end up with a massive pyramid, which is like three issues with a three dimensional pyramid. Uh, Mountain. Um, if someone does an action, you can say, oh, that person is right there. You're pointing to a segment. You're segmenting your list to a very specific sort of categories that are exclusive. Uh, not one person can be in more than two levels. That's the, that's the whole point. And uh, when they are somewhere, when they reach certain a certain point on the mountain, you offer them the options of where they can go next. They could go up, they could do the next logical thing in the campaign that you're running. They could donate or write a letter to the editor, but maybe they're not ready. So maybe they need to go around first. Maybe they have their national privacy, and maybe we are just running this thing on, on against the PPP, this massive online action. How about you take a look there first before heading out? Maybe after you've done that, you'll be more likely to donate and enter, uh, sort of go towards the top of the mountain. That's the whole point of it. You let the supporters choose. You don't force people up one way because that's the logical way that you've thought. You let them go up. And one thing that we figured out as well that we needed to do was to let people fall off or not fall off or walk down. Um, <laughs> the idea that if you're inactive in more than three months, then you're, you're no longer uh, you know, engaged supporter or active supporter. If you were to come back, we know that how far you made it before so you can you know, continue, we know how to talk to you because we already know what you did. Um, but if you haven't done anything in three months, then you're inactive and you're leaving our mountain of engagement. Any, any questions? Any, um, uh, how do you travel? We'll, we'll get to this in a bit, yeah. And so, the idea of the journey here is really the key. That's one of the key points that I'm trying to get across. That Collectivism is not an isolated act. Collectivism is a journey that someone takes towards real activism, if that, there is such a thing. And by real activism, I don't mean here uh, sabotage or uh, you know protests or you know setting things on fire or whatever you perceive as the traditional forms of activism, things that Morozov talks about. But activism as a political consciousness, that's what I mean by activism. If someone has clicked their way towards political awareness, engagement, then that, that then your journey uh, was successful. And, and you're, if you're creating a campaign, you're designing the journey. You're putting those signposts that you're trying to get people to follow a certain path or other path. Yes, Jeff? Out of your 750,000 people, how many would you consider So we have, a, we have a core, uh, there is, I'll talk about how we define our core. The idea of a core is that we have this sort of area on our mountain, sort of on the top, where we sort of gather all the most engaged people. Out of our 750,000, around 77,000 are now in that category. And I'll get to how, well, we started with, I think, 12,000 initially. People have already been there in how we defined it. And then by focusing on that growth and on that group, uh, we managed to get another 60,000 there, which uh, I'll, I'll talk about how in a, in a little bit. But yeah, it's a small, relatively small number out of the entire list. But then you have the rest spread all over the mountain, and they're moving, finding their <laughs> way up, and eventually they'll all be up there. That's going to be grand. Then again, illustrate this very same idea. If we look at this as a mountain, or a cone-ish structure, if you can think two-dimensionally, um, then every plate is sort of that step again. I'm reiterating the idea of the journey. 
One click doesn't automatically qualify someone for the court, for your engaged support. But it's a step in the right direction. Someone, it may take, you know, depending on the support, of course, it may take a thousand clicks before their view of the issue aligns with yours. And that's actually the idea of the core, is that whoever is in the core sees things the way you see them. They are, they have endorsed enough of your campaigns, or they have, you know, exhibited enough of their opinion that you can say, these people are on our side. They're not just clicktivists who click here and there, but they're actually like deeply invested into the issue that you're running. Uh, and again, that journey may take a thousand clicks, uh, how many clicks it takes. But it's a journey, and that's the way, that's how we need to think about collectivism. Um, this is essentially the only slide that I should have had in the presentation in the first place. If we take the definition of collectivism by, uh, I forgot the name of the guy from uh, Australia. No, it was Kosovsky or something like that. Anyway, uh, on the left, that's how we define collectivism. Now, our idea of activism in the digital realm, the online activism, is defined on the right. So, whereas in collectivism, someone engages an existing public culture, again, something you talked about before, an activist, an online activist, creates that object. They don't need to just like and share a tweet that you created, or a video that you created. They go out there and create a new tweet. They go out there and remix a video. They go out there and set up, write an article that they send you. They are creating those objects that other things can click on. Do you see what I'm getting at here? You are no longer you don't longer have to give them the signpost for where to go. They are able to do advice by themselves. Now there is an online activist invested in your issue. As, and as such, it's a premeditated gesture. They are no longer just reacting. Maybe it's a you know reaction to something that you put out there, but they have come the time, they put the time into creating something, that object, it's not a sort of impulsive, impulsive reaction. It demonstrates commitment, someone like that, you know, if we come back to the first case, this would be like the first night, kind of like, you know, that's like, you know, that's a serious relationship that you're in with a person, uh, I'll leave it at that point. Uh, it also requires specific knowledge, so there's another great difference from collectivism. And it's less easily replicated, because it's unique. If someone has put their own perspective into the subject. And so here you have an online activist and no longer a collectivist. Now, let's get some graphs. I sound like graphs. Uh, so why would you go, you know, what leads me to say that? What is it that we learned uh, that demonstrated that what that this model actually makes sense or is valid? This graph shows uh, an average open rate, click rate, and a uh, unsubscribe rate for uh, our list, or for segments of our list. Now the distinction here is based on uh, how many uh, pillars people have taken actions on. So those three issues that work on, we define them as pillars. So access, privacy, and free expression. If a person has done action on one pillar, whatever that pillar was, the average click-through rate would be, you know, 23, 25, even, yeah, 24% or so. If they have taken another action on another issue, and it may have been the most lowest, you know, most simplest, you know, simplest petition there was. But just by that, the average open rate increased dramatically up to, you know, it's over 30, 35 or so. And if they've done, if they walked around the mountain and explored all the issues that they were working on, then they are invested in your organization and they are not only much more likely to read your email, 45% uh, open rate for any of you who are sending out emails. Is a pretty remarkable number because yet yeah, that much is, is a, yeah, it doesn't happen. Not only that, though, they are much less likely to unsubscribe. Much less likely to unsubscribe, and that's that's the beauty. Those people have invested their time in the organization, in your cross. You can count on them. You can send them three emails a day, and they will not unsubscribe because they're they express enough commitment, enough, enough investment. In other words, this very same idea. If we take three. Uh, random blasts that we sent out uh, to our full list um, earlier this uh, this summer, actually, all about PPP, or actually no, slowly, most about net neutrality. Uh, you can see the blue line is sort of this sort of overall average. So for each, you know, uh, they performed relatively well, actually, for 40s. 
why I'll get to in a bit because we know exactly who to talk to. We just don't blanket send email to everyone and hoping that it will stick. We know exactly who is ready for the time on the phone. That's the person we send it to, which is why you can actually dramatically improve your open rates for that's another story. <laughs> but the idea being that you have been average, but then based on where people were at the pyramid and how much movement and how many clicks they have done on that mountain that we created, the rates differ dramatically. But more importantly, it's consistent. It's consistent. Your highly supportable across the board will always have, you know, we could talk with the person that thought, you know, twice as they're maybe three times as likely, twice as likely to open an email than uh, than someone who has done action on your one And it's that consistency that allowed us to develop this model and to, to think more sort of systematically about how we are engaging our supporters. Sorry. Oh okay, yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, DAP is a digital action team, so that's one of our, um, uh, it, it's part of the core, yeah, so it's volunteers who can uh, offer their yeah, translation, etc. Yeah. Would you say that we now is the same model? Uh, they may be by, by now, I don't think they were a lot of it, but uh, it's, it's, I mean, the idea of pyramid of engagement, that's been around for a while, a lot of, most groups actually are using that. Uh, this idea of a mountain engagement is pretty much just an extension of it. So I think most, most people are understanding that you can't just bundle all supporters together, that there are different types of supporters. This is just a way of, of segmenting them, or visualizing their, their movement. But, yeah. Um, my next question to that is, are they mutually exclusive? Is your tribe the same tribe as you now, or different tribe? That's, thank, that's a marvelous question. Thank you very much for asking the question. Because what it means is that the higher, and I'll just go around a little bit, what it means is that when people reach the core of the pyramid, they have clicked their way through, they have slack twisted their way through all of your share images, and they enter the core, they become publicly mindful. Then you can bet that they are on the list as well, that they have taken action with Vietnam, or Greenpeace, or you know, David Suzuki Foundation, or whatever other group. Those are people who are politically mindful. And how I know that? Because we ran collaborative actions. When, say, me, Outlook Media, and Elite Now will agree to build an action page on an issue that we are both passionate about. So we did that with, uh, with the Privacy Bill, C13, which, uh, which is currently an awful bill, who's on the petition against it, <laughs> whichever petition they're in. And then when, when it was hosted on our server, and, and I looked at the database of the people who took that action, and I saw that most of them were in the, in the upper sort of, you know, in the high levels of the pyramid or of the, of the mountain. We share those contacts. That's how collaborative agreements work. They get the list as well. And when we share them, we figure out that all two thirds of that list were already on their list. So you see what I'm getting into. You think people have clicked their way towards deep political awareness and engagement. Now, you could counter argue that it's still just collectivism. They are not uh, actually doing anything real. They are not. But that person, I bet you, is going to vote. I, I will do that research one day. I haven't done it yet. But yeah, so that's, that's, the, that's the beauty. Now, we've implemented this model five months ago. Uh, we've been working on it throughout the fall, uh, setting up the system for this, and then we launched it in, in uh, February, I think it was in March. Um, and since then, our list grew. We ran actions and had a 16% growth on our list. What is that? <coughs> Uh, it's yeah, around average. Yeah. So like yeah, actually slightly above average because we have some yeah, a lot of global actions or international actions. But what I'm trying to show here is that we focus our communication not so much on this growth. That's always a thing. We always kind of our list, but you know, you eventually will reach a critical mass. That's just the way things work. You can't just extend, you know, grow your list beyond eventually yeah, the growth slows down. What we focused on instead was moving people around. <coughs> So we looked at that mountain of engagement that we created, and we tried to figure out how we can get people who are already on our list, who are already done something, how, to, how we can get them to move around. And in here you can see the S1, S2, S3, those are three pillars. Uh, I won't tell you which one is which, but the idea is that we're trying to get them, you know, bridge them over to another, to another issue. So we think, if you've done a privacy action, how can we spin the privacy subject so that you will care about free expression. All of this we do with the belief that all of these issues tie to the narrative of internet freedom. 
that we are trying to get people to realize that all these issues are part of a larger story. But how can we convince them? And that was the exercise I've been trying to do. So when you're launching an action, say, on, on a free expression, we'll have a version that will go out to all the access people based on whatever level they are on sometimes. And we will talk to them in a language that we know they have responded to before. So we know that they were they got really upset about something specific, let's say OC13 pricing did. Well yeah, did they get upset? Here in that they sure don't like that guy. <laughs> so we spin that in a way that would allow them to connect the dots in their mind and bridge over to free expression. And then eventually I brought the you know area in the middle, the overlap between all three is the is the nirvana here. Uh, but anyway, we had massive growth there, massive growth. If you come down to a little bit more practical matters, such as finances, <laughs> we are, of course, grassroots funded, so that's something that we are also interested in. Uh, what happens when you combine the vertical and the horizontal movement? So people going up the pyramid, taking more higher variations, actions, and they have also done higher, other actions, higher variations, actions, and there's other issues. What effect does that have on donating? An interesting question. So you look at the numbers, and and I apologize for the language here, but survey takers was one of the campaigns that we run. And survey takers was a level three action. It was contributing. They have filled out a digital survey about how our future free expression should be legislation should be modeled. The leaders were on level four. Those were people who shared the survey and got other people to take the survey. And we created this sort of leaderboard where people could, you know, whoever got most people to share it to fill out the survey. And what prices, but anyway, so we had takers and then leaders, and leaders being directly about takers as level four engagement. So that's you know, it's a deliberate decision, but that's just how we define it. And then we looked at uh, the leaders based on whether they have been only on free expression issue, they have been on one pillar, or whether they have done actions across other pillars. And you can see, I don't know if you can read it, but people have just filled out the survey where you know. 15% or 12% of them were, were going to donate or donate it eventually to the campaign. Now, leaders were technically above them, but those who were only on one pillar down to 7 8%. And if I just continue reading the numbers, the leaders on level four who were on two pillars or three pillars, you can see exponential growth in the, the likelihood of them donating. What that means is that instead of just pushing people up, was worthwhile for us, more than worthwhile, to try to bridge them to other issues first before pushing them up because of this, because we eventually were able to run, you know, uh, I won't say the word, get, get more money out of them, of course, <laughs> at the point where we're able to sustain the campaign, which in the nonprofit world is, a, is a, another nirvana. So this is just to prove our point. Now, what do you need? So I was, we are leaving the sort of theoretical part. We'll come back to it shortly. Is there anything that I've left out that I've said all of it then to? Maybe. Uh, anyway. So what do you need? Uh, you need a CRM. If you're a nonprofit, you'll probably have one already. CRM is a, is, a, is a customer or a citizen or a consumer management system. So whatever you call it, it's, a, it's a usually a, you know, online the platform that you use to send your emails and use to track uh, action histories. So if someone does, does an action, it's usually logged in the CRM. To be able to develop this model, you will need a CRM. And I don't know, again, I have no idea where you guys are. We use Salsa. It's US based. Uh, I will not recommend the system, not one bit. Uh, it's not a, it's a, yeah, it works, but it's not ideal. Salesforce is another type of a, of a CRM. Nation Builder would be another type. Simply, it's a database that stores all of your main And it Key there is that it can also track an individual's action and public history. So you know who has received a given email, who has opened it, who has clicked on it. And then you also know who took an action, who donated, who shared, uh, which is yeah, it's a bit of a challenge to implement it because salsa is not ideal. Uh, but yeah, you can extend this as much as you want. And, and uh, if you have a developer in your, in your organization or group, you can go this beyond beyond belief, you can really play around with this. Now, to be able to sort of implement the model of, of the mountain, you will need some sort of knowledge of SQL. Um, SQL language is a, is a database, talking to the database, 
You could possibly go around it or without it. Some uh, CRMs have built in sort of reporting functions that will you know, automatize the reporting. You don't have to code at all, uh, which is great. And then you just simply need a tracking sheet where you weekly track how many people are on a given spot on the ground. So say you have that mountain, and it's the circle on the right. And uh, it's kind of confusing a little bit here, but the idea is that we've divided all our lists into those little segments. And each of those segments is a unique group in our database. Or you need, you know, uh, we run a query each Monday at 7.30 in the morning to know how many people are in each segment on the parent. Then we can know, you know, we had a 20% growth on level three on the privacy board. Wow, what happened? We know that we sent out an email before that we posted something on Facebook. We can evaluate how effective it was, what you know the growth was, how many people unsubscribed, uh, how many people bridged from other issues there. All of this is possible if you create a system of, of exclusive and uh, mutually exclusive segments and groups. We call them groups because just of the setup we have in Salsa. But it, it really just follows pure logic. If you have this mountain, one person can only be on one point of the pyramid. And as they leave a segment, they move to another segment. And you know, we, we for instance cannot track the journeys right now. If someone leaves a segment and goes to another segment, we know they're in that segment, but we have no idea where they came from. They may have just dropped into that segment, or they may have bridged over from another issue. Anyway, so there's limitations, and we have, you know, we can continue improving this until the end of uh, time. You need to embed the movement between the segments. The idea that you're not purposely trying to shuffle someone up, idea of shuffling or forcing someone to do something, that's the wrong attitude. You're inviting people on a journey. That's the, that's the mountains, you know, signposts. That's the whole thing, yeah. And of course, you track weekly. weekly. And this is an example of, of um, where we are at now, which is far from ideal, but it's, it's pretty, pretty great. Because this is just a snippet, the example of, for one of our pillars, so free expression, uh, I have these numbers on, on a Monday at seven at eight o'clock, and on any given day, anyone from the organization can come in and look and see how many people are on level two, level three, level four, level five. These things we have defined before. So first, thing we need to do is to, to define those segments. What constitutes level two action? You know, again, I re highly recommend Groundwire. Look up the number, look up the definitions. They did a great job of explaining a lot of organizations have implemented this. So you know exactly how many people there are now. What the, you know, out of the 100% of that big pillar, how, you know, how big the segments are. Uh, you know how many people joined on each pillar, or, or on each level, in those last seven days on the last subscribe. How many people have moved from one level to next. Uh, anyway, those are all SQL functions that just run automatically once we, you know, track the engagement. And, uh, it's only the top now. Uh, well, if they move down, they just the number go down, goes down. Yeah. So if there is a decrease and they haven't showed up anywhere else, then they must have become an active. So there is a sort of so if you run an action, we can expect that three months later there will be some sudden growth in, in on a certain level because people have become active. And similarly, just as you can do it for the sort of for the vertical movement on the levels, you can do it for the horizontal movement as well. So because we have three issues. We can also have three overlaps, actually four overlaps, right? So we have one and two, two and three, one and three, or one, two and three, right? Pretty simple. So for each of those segments, then we can figure out the size at any given time. This is how we track that we increased our overlap by 37% since you launched this, because we know exactly how many people have two actions across three pillars, three actions across three pillars, and so forth. So you know exactly how many people bridge. Once you can do this, this is this is the beginning of the journey, essentially. Because once you do this, you can start to set goals. You can say, by the end of the year, we want 25% of our list to be, so that may not be the correct number. Yeah, so we do want 25% of our list to be on more than one pillar. We want people to bridge, because we saw that it works. It really works, people become much more engaged. This is slightly off topic, but your unsubscribes are more than double your new joins. Is that yeah. a problem? That's a bad week. Yeah, no, so we had, yeah, so there were slower weeks, this is slower, I should have yeah, done something nicer. Yeah, I just wasn't sure whether you cared more about movement, for example, so you were willing to take the essence.
surprised because you're getting more movement. No, no. So once once you know exactly how many people are subscribed, you can see. Okay, so what happened in the last seven days? How many? How, how kind of thousand people are subscribed? You can see. Oh well, we sent this email. Maybe it wasn't a good idea. <laughs> then you start learning, and you're learning by observing. Yes, Jay. Operation budget. Yeah, so if you know that uh, you have to have so many people at level four, you have to have so many people at level two to maintain your organization. We, we, don't, we, don't, yeah, we don't have that established yet. No. But it's a, yeah, that's one of the goals that we have been talking about, but we are still fine tuning the system, and we will eventually have those numbers. Uh, but yeah, that's. So, but so you can see the possibilities are endless, really. Because you can start anticipating movement on the pyramid. You know, when you send out an email, you can say, okay, so based on our previous history, if 500 people don't bridge over whatever issue that we are trying to get here, then you fail. Because once you are tracking here, for each of those segments, we now have thresholds, email thresholds. We know that if someone is on a spot on the mountain, their open rate on average has been 27%. If it's below that or above it, you know that their email either sucked or worked. Or you know, you get our collection rate one. I don't know what it is. It's just a bad thing. Again, but, but um, yeah, so see what I'm getting. Yeah. Did you explain what open rate is? Open, oh, sorry, yeah. No, I, I, yeah. Oh, open rate, so let's say you, you sent a thousand emails. 100 people open and read the email, which usually the CRM records on. That's how the CRMs, that's why CRMs are even like MailChimp. If you send out a bulk email, a uh, certain number, certain percentage of people will open the email. That's called the open rate. Click through rate is the percentage of that all, all target group that is clicked. Uh, through open rate, we, yeah, it's not here, but through open rate is out of those who open the email, how many people click. That one is great for evaluating how effective your emails are because of your average through open rate, you know. Most people who open your email read, you know, most people who open and read your email click through. Some of the drops, you know that your language didn't work. Um, so you're learning here, yeah. And unsubscribe rate is out of the whole target group, how many, what the percentage of people are subscribed on your list. Yeah. Yeah. If you send tests for each one, yeah. like you, yeah. you segment a test for oh, each yes, one. Oh yes, absolutely. Which is the other beauty, because then you can experiment. And, and you know, perhaps there's ideas, you sit around in the office and think about this, so how could we bridge this person there? We have four ideas, we test them, whichever one works, we blast the whole or that segment with. So the last, I have one more slider, but uh, what this leads to is that for the first two years of open media, we would just send 400,000 emails to everyone on our list. If you have an issue, I just want everyone to pay attention immediately. Whatever the level of barrier was, everyone needed to take an action right away. That stopped working eventually. We stopped two bills, and that was grand. I mean, awesome. But you can't really sustain your organization with a model. Once we start to understand the different types of engagement, to understand what kind of engagement people are ready for, then we're able to tailor our communications. So on average, we send much more emails, but we significantly decrease our average target group. So instead of sending it to 400,000, we'll send emails by 20,000, 25,000. Know, any individual campaigner sends an email, you know, two, three emails a week on average, Two different segments based on a strategy that they develop to achieve whatever the goal is. But do you think that you should be maybe considering inactive? Inactive? We try to reach out to them once in a while if there's something major on launching. Uh, if they are inactive for more than seven months, then they just go into a group that we don't touch until the end of the year. And then we try to touch it, and then, yeah, anyway. So, do you yeah. then send one more big email at the end of the year? Are you really yeah, so a lot of nonprofits are running fundraising drives at the end of the year. So in December, we try to get every month uh, right in that sort of Christmas mood and get them to uh, give money. So we try them to reach out to them then. Yeah. yeah. Um, how do you, uh, when you're offering them options to move horizontally or vertically, do you do that in the same email or do that in separate emails? Or how does, how do you, so, that? Right. And this comes down to resources, of course. We don't have 30 people to charge, you know, to draft 30 different emails specifically in segments. But we figured that actually all that you need to do is change the first sentence of the email. And that's actually pretty hilarious because I don't have the numbers here. But if you acknowledge something that the person has done in the first paragraph, they are much more likely to do whatever you wanted them to do in that email. So for the digital action team members, which is our sort of core group of volunteers, 
Most of our emails are not what we are trying to implement at Twilio. It's a bit of a challenge. But most emails will acknowledge their membership in the den. And we'll talk to them in a very sort of, you know, you're so awesome. Very bad. You know, you clicked on this many, signed this many petitions. And yeah, yeah. So, you know, you've recently done this or that. I mean, it can get creepy. Yeah, it totally. Get, like, <laughs> it can absolutely push it. Uh, yeah, you're trying to stop private. Stuff. Yeah, but it's, it's you know, <laughs> but you know, you use it in a way that doesn't make sense. Um, another question. We are actually at the end, so I just was going to wrap some ideas uh, around. So digital activism does not equal slacktivism. This dichotomy between slacktivism on one end and digital activism on one other and the other end, or true activism, that's that's just not true. You need to slacktivist your way towards <laughs> deeper and deeper engagement. It's a journey. Slacktivism is a journey. Uh, and the purpose of groups such as such as mine, is open justice lead now, such as uh, David Suzuki, whatever group is facilitating online engagement, their really their primary purpose is to, to create a generation of digital activists, not slacktivists. No one wants to have a you know million slacktivists on their list because that just doesn't make sense. And they have worked once for one law, but you know, if you want to engage someone deeply, then you start with a slacktivist and you find a way how to turn the person into an uh, digital activist. You're creating a culture of engagement. That directly contradicts what the critics are saying about slacktivism. That it's creating a political, apathetic, uh, apathetic, uh, whatever the word is, uh, generation. Actually, you're doing the exact opposite. You're using slacktivism to wake people and empower people so they can actually do whatever their mind compels them to do. Voting, you know, I, and I will do the study of how many people actually vote after being you know, depending on how on the, on the ground they are. Takes, take things one click at a time. If you, if I'm now taking an action with another group, I can envision how they're understanding my engagement, how they are, you know, I can see me sitting on the other side of the screen and looking at the numbers and trying to understand, okay, is the person going to donate yet? Should we call them? Should we not call them yet? You, you learn by observing. You allow people to do their steps and whatever speed they want. You invite them and show them where they could go, all the different places, uh, knowing that all the places, all the paths eventually lead to the top. But you observe uh, how they're doing. And that, uh, that I believe is all. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, questions, questions. Yeah, Sorry, I didn't Yeah, so as you can see, my, my work at OpenGet is not campaign specific. I'm trying to be sort of behind the scenes across the board, organization wide. But each campaign has its own theory of change. So when, it, when you launch a campaign, it has a petition element to it, but it will always have a letter to an MP or you know, a tool that sends a letter to an MP, a tool that sends a letter to the editor, a bunch of donation forms, uh, opportunities for volunteers, for people to generate content. Every single campaign that we have run as open media, that's a bit of a different subject. You need to divide your theory of change into a series of steps. Or in other words, a series of clicks that people can, can take. Yeah. So yeah, it's not just about petitions. Is the petition the lowest barrier to that? Yeah. Although we already track whether you've read it or not. Which is and we already considered that sort of a step. So you know. Presumably, a lot of organizations that would be interested in using this model would have very meticulously formed mission statements, and they are very clear what their core looks like and what their principles are. Could you, in your experience, do you think that the um, maybe the rate of how people traverse the mountainside, whether it's virtual or online, whatever route they take, is there a relationship between? How much the core begins to reflect the uh, climbers, like the trend in the climbers' beliefs, and how many people actually get to the core? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, and that's that's the part that we are struggling with now to actually figure out the different types of the journeys. Oh, yeah, sorry. The question was uh, when you look at the people who are in the core, can you figure out sort of how they got there, essentially? That's a good question, or how? And, yeah. and there's also an element of like presumably the core would be somewhat static because the organization, um, uh, the organization has 
figured out their mission and has very specific principles. And yet all of the climbers are coming from a variety of perspectives. And you'd think with things like this, the issues are going to be very complex to begin with. So there might be elements that they agree with. And maybe the only reason they don't click is there's a minor element of the message that they don't agree with. So yeah, I mean, it's also true. And you're still mixing people together who have different, that travel different paths. That's another technical limitation of this model. Uh, and while they have different interests, different understanding of the issues, they may be really more passionate about privacy than they are about free expression. Uh, and we are figuring that piece out, but one thing to mention, when you enter the core, it's not the end of the journey. That's like, that's actually the beginning of the journey. We're trying to get, now that people are in the core, there is, we are now developing the same model, this exact same model, sort of mounting on top of the mountain, for the core people, because they can engage in a variety of new ways. For example, we can get people to, to share our campaigns. So we can now track how many people you generate, how many people you help take an action. And if you've crossed you know, a thousand or a hundred, then you know that's a certain level of engagement. And so we are tracking that now, developing system to track that. Uh, so you can you know, in other words, you have to stop in terms of building our levels. And you can define it in whatever makes sense for organization. And then actually coming to do that. This model was developed again really very much around the issues that we are working on. To apply those where we require yeah, revisiting of how the different levels are defined. Uh, you may have three levels, two levels instead of four or five. Uh, yeah, duration. Have you explored uh, like Marketo or Salesforce for nonprofits, something to replace your salsa software? Oh, yeah, we have, but we were kind of too deep down the rabbit hole. Yeah, so can you recommend anything as we explore? Uh, well, Salesforce is good, and Salesforce is a very good way of. of Tracking engagement, and it's because if you have a marketer on top of it, so you can also send mass emails from Salesforce and keep track of it. It you can do the exact same thing in Salesforce. You can do the exact same thing in, in Nation Builder. And actually, Nation Builder is an interesting thing because what Nation Builder does is the same. The way you can use it is that you actually tell people where they are. Right now, no one knows where they are. You, you know, someone may have signed an open your petition, and I could look up exactly where you're on the mountain, but you don't know. Nation Builder shows you a badge. It says, you know, you're on this level, and, you know, do this thing to, to, you know, anyway. So Nation Builder is a good one, but it's, yeah. it doesn't have, it's very limited in terms of custom customability. Salesforce is a good one. Um, Citizen URM. Essentially, any database that has an API that you can build on can be used. Yeah. But probably for, to start off with, if you're thinking of use, starting to use CRM, then Salesforce, you probably you might go to CRM. And I base also, but it's actually, it's magic. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are a particular challenge because of your size. Yeah, there are more challenges, but. <laughs> anyway, any other, any other questions? There's a little break. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, so I was wondering all the time that you're tracking here, whether you would make a generalization about um, the number of, uh, the frequency of emails going to one person. Um, where they aren't uh, click, they aren't clicking at all, and so um, at what point do you figure you're said you're he's oversaturated? Or? Uh, we haven't set our threshold. We keep trying. That's uh, to the annoyment of many people, of course. Uh, but if someone doesn't respond to an email, doesn't open an email, then we consider that might the email is inactive, and it's the sort of the six seven mark, month mark. And you know, people change email addresses, um, or just simply you know, the spamming is a major issue. You know, our email goes to spam all the time. So people, meet your, people may not even see our email. So that's what then when we then we try things such as usually our email has a sidebar with an image and a link and a logo. Then if we can reach people that way, then we just send a plain text email that's bound to circumvent whatever spam filter was catching us before. And so we so we have this, and we actually just found that last week. We had this like massive segment of people who were active last year, but not this year. And we just couldn't figure out why. Because they were like, you know, they, their emails weren't bouncing, they were you know being delivered. So we concluded they just weren't seeing them. Because if they were active last year, we were running issues or campaigns on very same issues. So we ran a series of tests where we would, you know, one was a plain text email, one was a very short copy, just like a paragraph, like, hey, miss ya. Another one was like a long, like, you know, this is a story over the last year. And then we saw that suddenly the, the rates differed. There was, you know, three percent difference on this email versus another email. And we saw, well, actually, it was a spamming issue. And we were able to get to more people just by simply simplifying the email. That means the plain text. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
No, I'm getting a little bit too deep into the books here. So any other any other questions? Qualifications. Are the castle legislations affecting you? That is a journey. That is a journey. I remember being the the one about this part at the the inspired uh, presentation in May or June when that issue was addressed. Two days after legislation was implemented, we were still under the impression that we had to have an opt-in on, on all of our checkboxes. And moreover, that all of our existing contacts, we needed to get, get express opt-in under whatever that was defined as before 2017. And then three days after budget was in effect, uh, CRTC said that non-profits are exempt. Charities were already exempt, and then extended the non-profits as well. And so we <coughs> celebrated, and yeah, so we are exempt from gas. If you're running a business, then that's a whole other story. Uh, people on the mountain, near mountain must have express consent. We well, we can't sell things. We don't sell things, so we can't, you know, ask you to buy a T-shirt. We can uh, ask you to donate, and we'll send you a T-shirt after that for donating. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, like, you know, like, yeah, it's, it's it's a commercial message, and we are not engaging in commercial activities, so we're actually. If there's another question, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you.